We just created the application for this course. In this lesson, I want to walk through that application and take a look at what that setup actually did. So the first thing I want to do is in, in IntelliJ, I just want to go up to File and Project Structure, or you can see the command semicolon keyboard shortcut. And I just always want to make sure, because I have been switching back and forth between Java 9 and Java 8 lately, that we are using the Java 9 SDK and that our language level for this project is at Java 9. So we get that um, IntelliSense and different um, features in the IDE uh, specific to Java 9. So I want to make sure that and then click OK. So as we saw towards the end of the last lesson, uh, it was refreshing all those dependencies. And when those dependencies were done, it basically brought in all of the libraries that we needed, included Java 9. Now what I want to do is kind of walk through the application here. So the first thing you'll see is we have these uh, mvnw script and command uh, script. And basically these are the Maven wrappers. So we have a maven.mvm folder here. So all this means is that if I go in and try to use the maven command mvn, you'll see that I don't have it installed on my machine. And you don't need maven installed because of this, because of this maven wrapper. And it's because of this I can run that script and now run a maven task. So I can say I want to go ahead and clean this project. And it'll go ahead and run through and do that. So that's just a little bit about the maven wrapper. And now what we're going to do is jump into the poem.xml. And this is the Maven poem file. And we have a bunch of stuff going on here, and I just want to walk through a little bit of it. So here we have information about our application that we provided during the Spring Initializer uh, startup. So whether you do this from the website or using your IDE, this is what it's doing. It's asking those questions because that's information we need to put in here. Then you'll see we have our version is 2.0. And this is a parent, which also jumps to the Spring Boot starter parent. So if you're in uh, your palm here, you can actually command, or uh, I'm going to command click, but you can control click if you're on Windows. And you can actually command click through. So I'm going to command click through to the starter parent. And there'll be a, some more information in here you can take a look at to kind of understand what's going on. Um, but you can also click through to another parent that they, we have defined here called the Spring Boot Dependencies. And here in the Spring Boot Dependencies, we have a list of all the different versions of the different software uh, libraries that we may use. So as you can see, we don't have to manage what versions we're using, which is really nice, and they've kind of done that for us. So that's just a little bit about that. And as we go down through here, now we have our dependencies. These are equivalent to what we were selecting during the um, creation process when we went through that little wizard. And you'll see there isn't a lot going on here. For such a big project that we're going to work on, there isn't a lot of dependencies. And if you remember, back when I talked about why do we use Spring Boot, one of the things that I mentioned is because of the Spring Boot starters. And that's what you're seeing here is Spring Boot Starter Actuator, Data JPA, Timeleaf, Web. These starters are comprised of other dependencies. So we know that when we want to build a web application here, we include the Spring Boot Starter Web, Again, we can command click through to it. And now that palm file here is going to include a bunch of other dependencies. So we may need uh, some JSON ability. We may want uh, an embedded Tomcat server. Again, these are starters. So if you wanted to click through to these, um, that would be, uh, oops, that would be more uh, dependencies that you'd see. So that's just a little bit about the starters and really what they help us do. They, they create the configuration needed to get our application started right away without having to worry about all the dependencies you'd have to declare along with the correct version numbers. 
And then finally down here, we have a build, which is our Spring Boot Maven plugin. So that's enough about that. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is what happens when we create our project. So there's a little bit of a folder structure going on here. So we have source, main, and test. So if you've done Java development before, this should look pretty familiar. In your test folder, you're gonna have all of your tests. We'll cover that later in this course. And then under main, you're gonna have Java and resources. So under resources, we have things for our static files, our templates, and our configuration properties. Under Java, we have our main package name, which we declared during the spring initializer. So we declared our main uh, group ID, which was com.vega, and then the artifact name, which was springit. So that those two combined created this default package, and it created one class underneath the default package. And this is the main file, the main application class for our application. And this is really nice because we have a public static void main method here, which makes running our Spring Boot applications really easy. We can run it right inside of our IDE here um, just by running this main method. We'll get to that in just a second. But I want to talk about this first. So we have this at Spring Boot application annotation. And this is kind of what makes this class special. Uh, if you were to take this off, uh, all of the kind of things that go on behind the scenes wouldn't really work. So if we command click into this, we can see that this annotation is basically just uh, comprised or made up of other annotations. The three most important ones are the Spring Boot configuration. So we're saying this is a configuration class. The at enable auto configuration. So this flag tells Spring Boot, I want to enable auto configuration. So look for all those auto configuration classes that we have. And in each of those classes, there'll be some type of configuration. And if those pass, then do your, do your magic. And finally, component scan. And component scan is going to help find all of the components in your application. And this is, we'll get into this more as we start to, to create our application, but this is why you always want to create your classes or any of your files, so your controllers, your services, your data files, anything you want, you should create underneath this main application because this at component scan is now searching within this um, package to look for other components. If you create them outside, say uh, com.vega.foo, then you need to be able to tell Spring, I want you to look in that package for classes as well. So not to get off on a tangent, but that's pretty much just all I wanted to say about that. So. Now we're ready to run our first application. Now we haven't really written anything. It's not going to do much, but it will allow us to go ahead and run this. So we have a couple ways that we can run this in uh, IntelliJ. I can right click, I can go to run spring it application. I can come up here, hit this little play button here, or right on this main method or right on this class, I can go ahead and say, I wanna run this application and let's go ahead and do that. So this is gonna fire up and it's gonna open a council for us and there's gonna be some things going on. So we're gonna take a look at this. So that started up pretty quick. Um, you are gonna get a warning here if you're running Java 9. Uh, it really has to do with the defaults in Java 9 and how Spring uses reflection in um, a particular package here. So there is you can see there's a use illegal access warn to enable these warnings further. Um, but you can go ahead and read up on this. This isn't gonna cause any harm. Uh, it's just running Spring Boot right now with Java 9. In Spring, there's actually an open issue about this and they're working on trying to fix this. But again, it's not going to hurt anything we're doing. So then you'll see some other information here in the logs. Tomcat was initialized with port 8080. Again, that's a default. We said that we we're building a web application. It went ahead and configured Tomcat for us and gave us a default port of 8080. 
There's some other things going on. We're not going to bore you by getting into all of this right now, but we'll start to look through this. Um, and this information will become a little bit more important as we start to develop applications. But what I do want to look at is down here it says Tomcat started on port 8080. So if we were to open up a browser right now and go to localhost 8080, we'd get a nice little error page because we haven't created anything yet. We haven't created any routes for the user to hit. But that tells me that our application is up and running. We can also go ahead and hit it from a terminal here. So we can say curl localhost 8080 and we should get um, an error. So again, we'll get an error. We'll get a nice UI error if we go to a browser. We're getting this nice JSON error when we go through terminal there. So that's about it. So here we are in our run application. If we want to shut it down, we can just hit this little stop guy. And our application is stopped. <clears throat> so I think that's all I wanted to cover. I just wanted to give you kind of a lay of the land, what that creating that initial project did, where everything is. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the requirements for this project and start to kind of map out what we're going to do as far as building this, this out. Uh, we'll get into some of the GitHub stuff and then we'll, we'll start writing some code. So with that, let's move on to the next lesson.